As we're waiting, if you all uh, who are joining would like to chime in in the chat, let us know where you're joining in from. That would be great, just so we can kind of get an understanding of where everyone is and and how large our network is. Oh, we're getting messages saying the chat is disabled, actually. I don't know how to do that. Um, Allison, I'm making you co-host. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, I think only the host can change the chat. Oh, maybe it's going to work now. Okay, there you are. Everyone should be able to chat freely. Welcome again. Okay, we will go ahead and get started this evening. I want to, first of all, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Venezuela, U.S. Attacks, Media Distortions, and Global Solidarity, which is also the launching webinar of the Venezuela Solidarity Network, a new network of folks uniting from the U.S. and Canada to take a stand against U.S and Canada attacks on Venezuela. I am joining uh, from here in Vancouver, British Columbia, which is the unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam nations. And as Marlon mentioned earlier, I encourage folks to also post in the chat where they're joining us from here today. My name is Alison Bodine. I am the coordinator of the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, and also author of the book, Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Venezuela from Battle of Ideas Press. My co mc this evening is Marlon Nunez, who is a first generation Venezuelan American with deep family roots in both the USA and Venezuela, who works on local political campaigns and is active in the Denver metro area of Colorado. And we'll get in later to more about the Venezuela Solidarity Network and tonight's uh, webinar, but I want to first pass the mic on to Marlon to make some remarks. Welcome, Marlon. Thanks so much, Allison. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Yes. All right. Great. Definitely want to check that out. Um, buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Good evening to everyone joining this evening. Um, I wanted to take a few moments uh, to stress why Venezuelan solidarity is so important. There is so much going on in the world right now, um, but this evening we're focusing on Venezuela uh, because, you know, I've been visiting Venezuela all my life in order to see family. Um, but it was really only this past August that I had the honor and privilege of participating in the first Kevin Zeese Brigade to feature the important work of the Venezuelan communes that I'm sure we'll hear more about, um, building a better tomorrow. I traveled there with other solidarity activists, many of whom helped to put this evening's launch event together and build the Venezuela Solidarity Network. In Venezuela this past August, we met with government officials uh, and were conveyed the official perspective on national struggles under the current sanctions regime. Uh, we toured social program interventions, such as the Barrio Adentro Urban Health Clinics. Um, but most importantly, we visited and volunteered with both urban and rural communes in and around Caracas, as well as in the more eastern states of Sucre and Anzuategui. There, we were shown powerful expressions of self-government that featured creative ways of producing new food sources, uh, such as raising tilapia in an abandoned swimming pool, 
We also saw how communities collect trash and separate out plastics in order to melt them down and form molds to build or even fix furniture. Like me, I'm sure you've seen fancy videos like that on YouTube of companies doing that over in Europe, for example. But the point is that the Venezuelan people can do it too, and they are doing it. It's, uh, and it's communities doing it for shared prosperity, not companies for profit. And throughout our entire experience in Venezuela, the guiding question that we had to challenge ourselves to think about was how much further might all of these projects go uh, would the country not be under a maximum pressure campaign by the USA and allies? Um, this is why solidarity is so much, so important. It rejects imposing one-size-fits-all economics and instead enables a people to access all the resources they need to reach their full potential themselves. So I'm so glad to welcome everybody here so that we can learn more about um, the, the, the sanctions regime and how we can circumvent that um, so that people can achieve their full potentials. Thank you, Marlon. Yeah, so Marlon, like uh, many others that are probably on this call, has had the opportunity to visit Venezuela to directly observe the people of Venezuela's resistance, their defense of their sovereignty, their self-determination and independence and also uh, to come back and get involved, which is the most important part of the work we do, to assume the responsibility that we have as people living in the United States and Canada to fight against cruel, illegal, unjust, criminal US, Canada, and other uh, Western government sanctions on Venezuela, but especially those from the United States and Canada. We have a really excellent panel today that's going to talk about some of the most pressing issues of the day, which is another reason why the Venezuela Solidarity Network is coming together at this time. It is actually 25 years ago, December 6th, 1998, that the elections were held in Venezuela that Comandante Hugo Chavez won. This could be seen as one of many important points in the development of the Bolivarian revolutionary process in Venezuela, and also seen as the one of the important points in US attacks on Venezuela and targeting of Venezuela for so-called regime change operations. Now, we won't go over all of Venezuela's history, but today we are facing a situation in Venezuela where the country is still under US blockade and sanctions, though there's been some temporary temporary uh, mm -hmm. sanctions relief, uh, but is also purely in the targets of the US and Canada still under all sorts of other attempts at intervention and the internal affairs of the people of Venezuela. Now, as people coming from the US and Canada, uh, we wanted to form the Venezuela Solidarity Network to strengthen and broaden our work for Venezuela. And I will just briefly read before we begin our uh, webinar, the basis of unity, and later encourage everyone on the webinar to join uh, the Venezuela Solidarity Network and find out more. We are organizing a Venezuela Solidarity Group of North American activists in opposition to the attacks by the U.S. and Canada. The approaching 2024 presidential election in Venezuela will likely precipitate ever greater regime change efforts by the imperialists accompanied by an intensified propaganda campaign. At the same time, the approaching 2024 US election will likely consume considerable energy among the progressive leaning public and some left activists who may be less inclined to criticize the current party in the US executive. Our intention is to build a solidarity group focused on Venezuela, similar to existing groups addressing Cuba and Nicaragua. We will focus on responding to the imperialist threat and avoid engaging in the internal politics of Venezuela. We will start with a core group of activists and then branch out as we are doing today, incorporating more, in, incorporating more individuals, activities and campaigns as our organizational capacity develops. This group intends to serve as a catalyst for solidarity work around Venezuela and to be a place to exchange ideas and launch projects and campaigns. 
Our focus will be to, to lift the deadly U.S. sanctions and fight against all forms of imperialist attacks against Venezuela, including supporting the Free Alex Saab campaign. Alex Saab is a Venezuelan diplomat held in U.S. jail. Our meetings will regularly take time to report on and discuss the current situation in Venezuela. So that is our basis of unity. An introduction to who the Venezuela Solidarity Network is and the reason why this work is so urgent and necessary at this time. Again, thank you all for joining us tonight. Without further ado, I will start introducing our panel. Um, I wanted to say uh, that we will have three speakers tonight. We have Leonardo Flores, Maria Paez Victor, and Joe Emersberger to introduce some important uh, discussion topics on Venezuela and share some important analysis. And then we'll have time for question and answer. Leonardo Flores is going to start. He is an analyst on US-Venezuela relations. Leonardo was born in Venezuela and maintains close ties to social movements that have transformed the country over the past 20 years. Leonardo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Allison, and thank you, Marlon, for, for hosting this really important launch of the Venezuela Solidarity Network. And I want to start off by mentioning that we chose today, December 6th, because it's the 25th anniversary of Chavez's first election. So it's an important day to remember because really that's what set off this period of incredible transformation that unfortunately, because of sanctions, because of U.S. hybrid war, because of attempts to overthrow the government, has seen you know some substantial setbacks in the past roughly 10 years or so, but still the Venezuelan people are in, uh, enduring and, and attempting to thrive in these adverse conditions. And it, as Allison mentioned, you know, we see the, the Venezuela Solidarity Network as a way of coordinating the efforts of organizations and people who work on Venezuela. And there's lots of us who do this both in the United States and Canada. Uh, so today I thought I would give a few updates on some of the cur current events and then lay out what I see are some of the priorities for Venezuela solidarity work over the next year. And I first wanted to talk about uh, the, the Barbados Agreement. So this was an, a deal that was signed by the Venezuelan government in opposition on October 16th, and it, and it included a roadmap for electoral conditions and an agreement to defend vital Venezuelan interests, including Sitco and the Sakibo region, which is something that Maria is going to speak about later. And in exchange, the U.S. Tempor temporarily suspended sanctions related to oil, gas, gold, and Venezuela's central bank. And additionally, the U.S. and Venezuela came to an agreement that would allow the U.S. to deport Venezuelan nationals back to Venezuela. But if you were reading the media in the days right before this, right before and after this deal was signed, you would see quote after quote from uh, spokespeople from the White House and from other from the State Department insisting that the deal was going to include a lifting of the disqualifications for the 2024 presidential elections, including for Maria Corina Machado, who has basically been anointed by the U.S. as the Venezuelan opposition leader, uh, which much to the chagrin of other opposition leaders in Venezuela who might actually have more support than her than we likely do. So, but what's actually clear is that there was no such provision in the deal. Right. The, the deal actually was very clear that it was going to they were going to allow the pl political participation of individuals and parties, but strictly in compliance with the Venezuelan constitution and law. And it's by law. It's not some sort of win on the part of the Maduro government that some of these people are disqualified from running. So then the U.S. began to speak about a November 30 deadline for a process for lifting the disqualifications or the sanctions would be reimposed, what they're calling a snapback of sanctions. November 30th came, and then it was announced that there was another agreement reached in Barbados to allow disqualified candidates to appeal directly to the Venezuela Supreme Court. And this was seen as basically as the way for the U.S. to get Machado back on the ballot. Uh, but again, the way this the, the, the November 30th agreement was, was written, it suggested that she'd remain in, ineligible. And I think Maria is going to talk a little bit about that. So I'll leave that uh, for her to discuss. Uh, but in terms of you know what act, what this means for activists in North America, I really think we need to keep pushing for the lifting of, of sanctions for them to become permanent. Because really what we saw from this agreement on the U.S. side was that the general licenses uh, were issued for six months. And these are licenses that basically allow business in the sectors that I mentioned. But because they are temporary, they're going to have a very limited economic impact. You know, companies are either not going to want to invest as sanctions can be snapped back or 
they're going to press for better terms from the Venezuelan government because they're taking a risk because of sanctions might be snapped back. Furthermore, I think that a lot of us are concerned that if Maduro wins the elections, which at this point is a, a good bet, it's, you know, we're still a long way away, but who knows? Uh, we're concerned that the U.S. is automatically going to reimpose the sanctions. And my book, that really just amounts to electoral interference. And it wouldn't be the first time we've seen that, right? I think Nicaragua went, went through something very similar in the 90s, where it basically told the Nicaraguan people that if they you vote Sandismo out, we're going to lift the sanctions. And I think that's going to be the sim a similar sort of message that the Biden administration is going to push in advance of the 2024 elections in Venezuela. So why did the Barbados deal happen now? I think from the Venezuelan side, uh, the agreement is basically almost identical to one offered in 2018 that the Trump administration ended up sabotaging at the last minute. And the agreement is also nearly identical to something that was signed in 2021, in August 2021, by smaller opposition parties in advance of the regional elections held that year. So why did the tradi more traditional opposition parties sign this year, the bigger ones, the so-called G4? Well, basically because their coup attempts have been completely defeated, right? The Juan Guaido era is totally over. The sanctions, while they're still in place and they're still harming Venezuela, you know, Venezuela actually hit, already hit rock bottom and the economy has been growing slowly, but it has been growing. And that's a sign of worry for the people who impose the sanctions because they thought they were really going to destroy it. Venezuela the economy to such a point that the people would have no option but to rise up and overthrow their government. And clearly that didn't happen. So their strategy failed and they were forced to go back to the negotiating table. And from the U.S. perspective, I think, you know, the easy answer is oil prices, right? So oil prices and access to oil, are that's persistent concern for the United States. And I think the White House maybe expected that, you know, the oil markets would be settled a bit. Uh, in advance of, you know, the U.S. election and Biden's own election campaign, if you had shown some sort of progress with Venezuela relating to sanctions. Uh, but I think an actual bigger factor is migration, right? Because lately, and when I say lately, in the past two, two and a half years, there's been a lot of pressure on Biden over, over the border by Republicans. And we've seen really awful stunts by Republican governors of busing or flying Venezuelan migrants to other states, often without their knowledge and sometimes in the middle of winter. I think uh, someone basically uh, compared it to human trafficking. And I think there are, you know, ser a serious uh, accusation can be made of human trafficking in some of these cases where migrants were just put on buses to go north to everywhere from D.C. to New York to New Hampshire to, to Martha's Vineyard. And, and they had no idea what was going on. And then on the other side of the equation, you had a letter sent by members of Congress, mostly, if not all, I think might have been Democrats, in May of this year, drawing a connection between sanctions and migration. So Biden was feeling the pressure from kind of both sides, both from within his party and from the Republicans. On top of that, there was a delegation by members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus to various South American countries. This happened in August of this year, and where they really heard directly from, especially in Brazil and in Colombia, about the correlation between sanctions and migration. They came back and they went on this kind of, you know, the Sunday talk shows talking about that and pushing that issue. And, and that's one of the reasons that Biden was so kind of eager to make this deal with Venezuela. And we see kind of, we saw results immediately. It's here are some numbers that after the sanctions deal, right? There was a nearly 50% drop in Venezuelan migrants uh, in late October compared to late September, apprehended Venezuelan migrants apprehended at the border after this Barbados deal. So immediately, would you have this deal and it leads to a 50% drop in Venezuelan migration? U.S. media attributed it to Biden being able, it, being able to resume deportations, that somehow Venezuelans were afraid of being deported. I don't know if that's really the only explanation, but it's also worth noting that this deportation business came about because, as a result of the Barbados Agreement, because the, that was a deal that the Venezuelans had to agree to because, as well, to, to re allow the U.S. to deport them. And then, you know, since this Barbados agreement, there's been this kind of another factor besides the disqualifications that the U.S. keeps harping on. And that has been the fact that they're insisting that Venezuela release prisoners, including detained U.S. citizens. Well, in, a, in fact, Venezuela released five pr prisoners as a result of the Barbados deal. And but the fact that and all of those were actually from Venezuela. The fact that no U.S. citizens were released has led to a lot of criticism of the Biden administration. But the U.S. is kind of playing hardball. You have Francisco Palmieri, the top uh, U.S. diplomat on Venezuelan affairs. He admitted that there had, there had been discussions of a swap for Alex Saab, who Allison mentioned, for American citizens. 
that talks about these this uh, potential swap were held on the sidelines of the negotiations of Barbados, but he called this a distraction, which is kind of madness that 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 they're pushing for this release of prisoners, but the one prisoner that Venezuela wants is now is somehow a distraction. And just the other day, when a de the de detained U.S. citizens released an audio recording saying there was a deal on the table for 20 Venezuelans and 13 Americans in a prisoner swap. So on the Venezuelan side, they're offering over 30 people to swap. On the U.S. side, they're refusing to include Alex Saab. So when we are talking about the priorities for Venezuela solidarity in the upcoming year, I think this is really one of them, right? This push for Alex Saab. Because on top of this, there's already been a resolution introduced in Congress around one of the detained U.S. citizens. There's 56 co-sponsors in, co in the House and six in the Senate around Aben Hernandez releasing him. So the, we're going to, in response, I think we're, one of the things we're going to do in the upcoming year is hold an advocacy day on Capitol Hill to draw attention to the case of Alex Saab and to connect Alex Saab to these U.S. citizens detained in Venezuela. Other priorities, of course, the 2024 elections. Joe's going to speak about that, so I'm not going to talk about that. But the frozen funds. In October 2022, the government, Venezuelan government and opposition reached a different deal on, on unfreezing $3.2 billion in funds to be administered by the UN and spent on health, education, on the electric grid. Not one cent has been released yet, even though this happened well over a year ago, and all signs point to the Biden administration dragging its feet, despite having given positive indications about the deal. And other, a few other priorities. I think really we really need to start focusing on the Venezuelan diaspora, getting them involved in anti-sanctions work, and brainstorming ways of attracting Venezuelan migrants who might not necessarily be Chavista, but they might be anti-sanctions. And one of those ways is to start pushing for consular services. You know, the UN in the U.S., Venezuelan migrants are over there are over a million of us now, and we have no consular representation. That makes it incredibly difficult to get routine paperwork done, and people actually have to travel to Mexico or Canada to just get passports. And of course, another issue that we should press for is to allow U.S. airlines to fly back to Venezuela, because while they're allowed to, allowed to engage in flights for deportations, they're not allowed to do commercial flights. And that really puts a big financial burden on Venezuelans who want to go back to visit their countries and that they now have to pay basically extra to travel to third countries. But of course, the focus really should be on saying no to snapping back the sanctions and pushing for a permanent end to the sanctions. And I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leonardo. It's been so great to organize you, uh, organize with you uh, these past number of years, uh, even in D.C., um, I want to uh, introduce our next champion, Maria Paez Victor. Uh, Maria is one of the founders of the Luis Riel Bolivarian Circle, founded in 2003 in Toronto, Canada. She's a sociologist born in Venezuela with graduate degrees from Venezuela, but also the United Kingdom and Canada. She is additionally the producer of the only radio program in Canada exclusively on Venezuela. Venezuela Viva. So welcome, Maria. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank uh, the organizers, Allison, um, Leonardo, Marlon, Joe, sure. Michelle. Uh, your solidarity means so much. So thank you very much for the the group and for this webinar. I'm, I'm most honored to have been asked to be here. So I've been asked to talk about the Esequibo. Well, what's at stake here is not just a territorial dispute between two nations. And while these disputes over land are rarely simple affairs anywhere in the world, um, the Ezequibo dispute is characterized by a, a third factor, the actions of one of the wealthiest, most powerful, most irresponsible oil corporations in the world, ExxonMobil is not so much two nations pitted against each other, but the sovereignty of the Venezuelan nation state pitted against a giant multinational corporation. It's democracy versus plutocracy, the common good versus a stratospheric private profit. It is sovereignty against colonialism. Let's look at the border. There are three significant facts about the border dispute over the Guayana Esequibo, and I'd like to share this screen with you. This one, right? Yeah. Oh, oh dear. There, can you see that? Can, can yes. you all see yeah, that? That looks yep. great. Good. Yep. So, 
the three significant facts about the border dispute are this, that the river Esequibo, which is right here, has always been the eastern border of Venezuela since it was first mapped by the Spanish. All ancient maps attest to this. Um, this dispute has been going on for more than a century and a half. Here you see a map of uh, 1810 that no Venezuelan government has denied or relinquished or ceded its claim over this territory. So this is not an issue of the Maduro or the Chavez government, but of the Venezuelan state itself, not any specific administration. It's a question of national territory, uh, its boundaries, identity, and sovereignty. That the this here you see the parts that also include uh, the the, um, uh, the the seas. That the British Empire sought to acquire the disputed land with stealth, with false cartography and lawfare through a tribunal rigged by a powerful British Empire against then a smaller very poor and vulnerable uh, country, Venezuela. Now let's look at the Paris Tribunal of 1899. British explorers entered and claimed the land to the east of the river Esequibo that eventually became British Guiana. Now through a deliberate misinformation campaign that involved the bogus cartography of one R. Schomburg, Britain took over Venezuelan lands to the west of the river, um, especially around the eight, mid 1800s looking for gold. And in 1899, taking advantage that an impoverished Venezuela was in the middle of a civil war, La Revolución Liberal Restauradora, an arbitral tribunal was concocted in Paris with three judges, one from Britain, one from the USA, and one from Imperial Russia. That is three empires. And there was no representation from Venezuela at all, none. The USA alleging its own Monroe Doctrine took it upon itself to say that they represented Venezuela. But instead of defending the country against European colonization as the Monroe Doctrine was supposed to do, the USA took the side of the European colonizer the British Empire, and decided against Venezuela, giving the Esequibo land to British Guiana. Even mainstream uh, uh, press at that time mocked this decision as a powerful country, Britain, stealing from a much poorer and weaker nation, Venezuela. Here you see one of uh, the cartoons in the mainstream press. You see the imperial lion of Britain with its claws on Venezuela. Here you see Britain stealing all the deeds of Venezuela running, uh, and you see in the back there, Venezuelan mission, and down at the bottom says peace and plenty. And here you see the two empires, Uncle Sam and Britain uh, toasting uh, because that they uh, had won and taken all this land from Venezuela. So can I stop this? Um, oh, okay, I'll stop. So enter the 1966 Geneva Accord. All through these years, subsequent Venezuelan governments, all, all governments, Leoni, Betancur, uh, uh, Medina, all of these uh, governments protested and resisted this decision as unfair until 1966 when the UN Geneva Accord was agreed upon. It categorically declared that the 1899 Paris Tribunal decision was null and void because of the outright injustice of having no Venezuelan input. By this accord of, of 1966, both parties, now Guyana, which is, was no longer British Guyana, but Guyana and Venezuela, agreed to settle amicably the conflicts regarding the Esequibo. So the Geneva Accord was being fully respected by both nations until 2014, when the ExxonMobil was allowed by Guyana without asking Venezuela to do explorations and it discovered oil on the Esequibo coast on the disputed sea area. It's estimated that to be about 10 billion oil barrels. 
This oil company has a history of cheating Venezuela. For years, it hid the oil reserves along the Orinoco River, telling the government that that was useless, useless carbon tar, you know. The previous government signed contracts with oil companies whereby they paid Venezuela 1% in royalties, paid no taxes, and extracted oil at the cost of $5, but the Venezuelans uh, had to buy it back. So he so they sold it back to Venezuela for 20 and $25. With the laws passed by President Chavez in 2007, all that changed. And the state oil company, PDVSA, now had to have the greater portion of shares to any private public concession. Other companies uh, agreed to have this mixed private public arrangement with PDVSA, Chevron, Texaco, Total, uh, British Pet Petroleum. But ExxonMobil and ConocoPhillips refused. They have always displayed enmity against Venezuela. ExxonMobil then sued Venezuela when it nationalized three of their concessions. And the company demanded before the World Bank Tribunal that Venezuela pay them $20 billion in compensation. But Venezuela appealed to the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes and its sentence in favor of Venezuela and reduced the amount it was to pay the oil company to only $1.4 billion. This incensed, absolutely incensed, the president of ExxonMobil, who was none other than Rex Tillerson, who later went to be U.S. President Trump's Secretary of State, which explains much of the increased aggression of Trump, the Trump government against Venezuela. Now, all the ongoing amicable negotiations that had been going on between Venezuela and Guyana ended as the wealth of ExxonMobil obtained the upper hand of the government of Guyana. About 26 million has been handed to Guyana in exchange for refusing to negotiate further with Venezuela, denouncing the Geneva Accord of 1966, and demanding that the decision of the 1899 Paris Tribunal be enforced through what? Through yet another biased team of judges at the International Court of Justice. That actually has no jurisdiction except its own self-enlarged mandate. This is the monster that has bought Guyana and that is attacking the sovereignty of Venezuela. ExxonMobil has bought the compliance of Guyana and is venting all its spite against Venezuela to the point that it's threatening Venezuela with the U.S. Southern Command, whose fleet of uh, warships are off the coast of Ezequiel. The president of Guyana was indiscreet enough to openly threaten Venezuela with the American uh, with the American fleet, and uh, it, which did not go down well with Biden, but uh, he is building a military base for the Southern Command on the disputed land. Now, t take a look at Guyana. Guyana has the lowest human development index in South America, with an extreme poverty of thirty five percent of its population. And more than half of its population lives abroad, and, and, and it's the uh, more educated half. And this poor country is going to receive only 25% of ExxonMobil's profits. Its indigenous people in the Esequibo have been sadly neglected, and most of them consider themselves Venezuelan, or at least of dual uh, nationality. And it's a far cry from the rights and the services that the Venezuelan indigenous people enjoy. Ironic, ironically, um, Venezuela has spread the uh, Cuyana, sorry, has spread the malicious lie that Venezuela wants to invade the Esequibo, making Guyana out to be some sort of victim of Venezuela. When it's Guyana that has carried out several war exercises with the Southern Command with Venezuela as its target and has openly threatened the country with the U.S. fleet. Now, there's nothing that the U.S. would welcome more than a cause, real or not, to invade Venezuela and get its hands on its riches. It can no longer count on stooge right-wing governments in Colombia or Brazil, so now it's manipulating Guyana to be its surrogate warmonger. Now enter the referendum. Now, in according to the Constitution of Venezuela, as a participatory socialist democracy, President Maduro decided to consult his people on the Esequibo issue with a referendum. 
Immediately, ExxonMobil and Guyana went to the International Court of Justice that has no jurisdiction in the matter to ask it to do something impossible, to stop Venezuela from carrying out a referendum on its own people. Uh, with ExxonMobil, of course, paying the tab of $18 million for Guyana's legal fees to that court. Venezuela's constitution emphatically declares that the nation's sovereignty resides in the people and that the republic is democratic and participatory. Furthermore, that referenda are indicated as one of the ways in which the people can exercise their sovereignty and that matters of special national transcendence can be submitted to a consultative referendum. These are articles 10, 70, and 71 of the constitution. Therefore, a referendum was carried out on December 3rd, a few days ago, asking Venezuela, Venezuelans if they reject the 1899 tribunal arbitration, they, if they agree that the 1966 Geneva Court is the only binding mechanism to resolve disputes, reject the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, and if they agree with establishing a new Venezuelan state called Guayana Esequiba in the disputed land, granting Venezuelan citizenship to its inhabitants and implementing accelerated social programs. Well, Guyana lost this gambit because the, the ICJ ruled that Venezuela has every right to call a referendum for its own people. It just shows how threatened ExxonMobil and Guyana were with this display of democratic power. It also lost because the Venezuelan population that cast more than 10 million votes voted overwhelmingly yes to all five questions. It was a remarkable display of national unity that brought together for the first time in 25 years, government, opposition, private sector, unions, educators, artists, students. It seemed a tsunami of yes votes. And instead of threatening any border war, all Venezuelan spokesmen, persons and leaders have said that the dispute should be resolved in an amicable manner following the precepts of the 1966 G Geneva Accord. Venezuela understands that a border wall would be an excuse for U.S. invasion. So what is at stake? Democracy versus a corporation, common good versus unfettered private greed, sovereignty versus judicial colonization. This is not merely um, a territorial dispute uh, between two countries, but more than that, what is at stake is the validity of international law, the integrity of the UN Geneva Accord of 1966, and the honesty of the International Court of Justice. In the end, it is the struggle between democracy and international law against the rapacious greed of a powerful oil corporation in the service of the Empire of the United States However, Venezuela has previous experience in defeating an empire. I want to put up here in this um, in this uh, if you can see uh, what ExxonMobil has done, um, and also I have here uh, some data on Gujana, uh, some data about Venezuela, I just want to underline the fact that the only time Venezuelan troops have left the country was to liberate Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Peru from the Spanish empire. Um, and, uh, in, and in the three minutes that I have left, I want to talk about the Machado woman. As to Maria Corina Machado, she will have a place in history along with Juan Guaido, keeping company with the infamous Malinche who betrayed her Aztec people by siding with Cortes and all the traitors in between. Unlike Guaido, who was practically unknown, Machado is a well-known political gadfly. For years, she has spouted her alliance with Washington to the point that she has publicly, um, she has publicly supported US sanctions. She's asked for more sanctions and astonish me publicly asked for the USA to invade her own country. She is in the political arena due to the millions that the Northern superpower has given her. You can see videos where she's supporting Venezuela's claim to the Essequibo. Then she abruptly changed sides. 
rejecting the referendum and supporting Guyana. This happened because Almagro, that unfortunate puppet with a disordered mind that runs the OAS, threatened Machado with denying his support in finance unless she rejected the referendum and sided with Guyana. So the Machado did what her owners bid her. She is relegated to the dregs of Venezuelan history because never has Venezuela ever shown such an overwhelming vote for an issue as this referendum backing Venezuela's defense of its boundary. And she opposed it. And it was not 10 million Chavistas who voted because the Chavista forces have never reached 10 million. It truly was a display of national unity. It's quite significant that the other opposition parties have been virulent in criticizing her. Now, the funny thing is that Machado threatened the government saying that if they did not reinstate her and others who are barred by law from running again because of their misdeeds by November 30th, that the USA would reinstate the sanctions that have been suspended. And pigs would fly if the US would value Machado before their oil deals, which is all about these sanctions that were lifted. Um, Machado, by the way, has been disen, uh, disenfranchised, cannot vote again, because first of all, she took it upon herself being a member of Venezuelan uh, National Assembly to go and join the Parliament of Panama because she wanted to go to a meeting uh, uh, representing Panama so she could speak badly of Venezuela. Then, on top of that, she has refused to uh, give accountability to the government of where her money is coming from. Machado is finished politically and should go and join her political twin, Guaido, in Miami. If if Biden is, is, is putting his, uh, uh, his money on her, uh, he is sadly mistaken. She is nowhere in Venezuela. Uh, she's one of the most despised people along with Guaido. So thank you. I'm sorry I took a few minutes more. No worries at all, Maria. Thank you for uh, sharing with us some um, important information that definitely has not made it through U.S. and Canada major media, especially about Essequibo. And um, important also to know more about what the landscape is looking like for the upcoming presidential election and the lies that the US government and their allies are telling about Venezuela's democratic process. So um, really appreciate that information and uh, continues to fuel our solidarity work. Um, everything that you do and write and your radio show and all of that is very important. Um, I wanted to also uh, just take a moment to say some folks are already posting in the Q&A, which is excellent. If people could put their questions in the Q&A, we will have time. It's a box that's in the middle of your screen. Um, and if the panelists want to take a look there and start thinking about responses, that works too. Uh, but we will go ahead and have our final panelist who has the job of uh, many, many jobs of uh, bringing some more new information, but also wrapping up the panel, which is always difficult. So I want to invite Joe Emmerich Berger, who is a Unifor Union member with Ecuadorian Roots, who is co-author of Extraordinary Threat, The U.S. Empire, The Media, and 20 Years of Coup Attempts in Venezuela, which came out in 2021, I believe on Monthly Review Press, uh, among other work that Joe does that is the most recent book. So um, Joe, the floor is yours. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Thanks to everyone for making this event happen. So I'll, I'll get right into it. Uh, as we get closer to Venezuela's presidential election in 2024, we should anticipate the Western media deploying the same general tactics they used to disparage Maduro's electoral victory in 2018. Now, I'm not predicting Maduro is going to win again. I hope he does. But if he does win, especially, we can anticipate the same general propaganda tactics will be used with some variations for the change situation that exists in Venezuela and around the world since 2018. Um, Western media constantly imposes a false history on us. So a key part of fighting back is making sure we're clear on the, on the facts, on the historical facts that they bury and lie about. But it also should involve rejecting the imperial assumptions that are sold to everyone as part of the Western media's false history. So one, one key assumption that I'll that I'll make right off the bat is that US US backed subversives like Machado must have total impunity. Uh, the Western media not only insist that the US accomplices be out of jail, 
uh, like Guaido, who never went to jail the, after declaring after Trump appointed him president. But no matter how openly they've collaborated with a foreign power to do tremendous harm to Venezuela, they must have full political rights. I mean, the very first article of Venezuela's constitution asserts its independence and its right to defend itself against foreign threats. But to Western media, that part of West Venezuela's constitution can be completely disregarded. I mean, does anyone think that Venezuela has the right to destroy the U.S. economy as part of a strategy to put the politicians it prefers into power in Washington? And in this really wildly hypothetical scenario, that any U.S. politician who helps Venezuela do that should get away with it. I mean, it sounds absolutely nuts, but that's the kind of assumption that's woven into the Western media's coverage, that U.S.-backed subversion must come with total impunity. And that kind of assumption is reinforced by, by some so-called dissent that, some, some, that we sometimes see in Western media, generally coming from politicians labeled progressive who may criticize U.S. sanctions on Venezuela, but not to reject the most toxic imperial assumptions. Now, I'm going to speak in general terms about what the media did in 2018. Uh, if people want detailed examples taken from the media, please check out the book that uh, Allison already mentioned that I wrote with Justin Pudor. Um, since at least 2002, the Western media has been trying to help the U.S. overthrow the Chavista movement that uh, Maduro has led since the death of Hugo Chavez in 2013. I mean, since we mentioned Machado, I'll just throw in the Machado signed the infamous Carmota decree of 2002. Uh, that uh, that very briefly imposed a U.S. supported dictatorship in Venezuela. Um, in 2019, when U.S. President Donald Trump declared Juan Guaido to be Venezuela's interim president, the entire Western establishment, which includes a great many people who claim they hate Trump, still went along with him on that. And again, the key, key, the key lie that they were all united in repeating was that Maduro's 2018 election uh, win was fraudulent. Now, for years after the election, uh, outlets like Reuters and the New York Times, they would just state without without citing any evidence whatsoever that the, the election was widely seen as fraudulent. And we were all supposed to accept that based on the presumed credibility of the same Western establishment that is presently supporting an obvious genocide in Gaza. Now, for a short time in 2019, Bernie Sanders timidly resisted the lie that the 2018 election was uh was fraudulent, but he ultimately caved completely to the Western establishment's line that the Maduro that Maduro was a dictator, and Sanders even at one point called in 2019 called Maduro a quote vicious tyrant. So today I can't help mentioning that Sanders has exposed himself as so vicious that he can't even support a ceasefire in Gaza. Now that said, well while the media ultimately took to declaring Maduro's 2018 uh, election victory fraudulent without without citing evidence or arguments or anything. That wasn't always the case. I mean, in the months leaving, leading up to the election and shortly afterwards, there were some general uh, justifications that came out of their coverage. Uh, one was that there was no credible challenger uh, against Maduro. OK, so the Western media at that time played up the disqualifications of Enrique Capriles and Leopoldo Lopez as candidates. Now, these two politicians were involved in multiple uh, U.S. back coup attempts going back to 2002. But again, to Western media, no consequences are, are supposed to uh, be imposed on people who uh, go along with U.S. back coup attempts, not even the loss of political rights. But there's another big problem with the, with the argument that is that Henry Falcon was a credible challenger to uh, Maduro, according to data analysis. Now, if you go through LexisNexis, you'll find that that analysis is an anti-Chavista pollster who was by far the most cited in Western media for several years. Uh, so they, they were the, the, the go-to pollster for the Western media. And this, this pollster claimed that Falcon was, in fact, a credible challenger to Maduro, that he could, could have beaten Maduro in 2018. And Maduro was in, uh, Falcon was, in fact, threatened with U.S. sanctions for running in, in the election. And he was aggressively attacked by other po opposition parties uh, for running. He was uh, called uh, you know, like a, a false opponent or a, a stooge of uh, basically a puppet of, of, uh, of Maduro's. Now, the Western media could have attacked that analysis and said they don't believe their polling. Uh, but how do you do that, given how frequently you've claimed to believe them and, and that you also believe their, their polling numbers for Maduro? So the, the approach the media took instead was to, to evade those contradictions, was basically that pretending that Falcone's candidacy didn't exist. And also, and thereby ignoring all the access that Falcone was giving to the given to the state and private media to to attack to attack Maduro during the campaign. So after the election, uh, when, the, when Maduro won, uh, nobody tried to claim that Falcone had really won. I mean, Falcone received roughly two million votes, while uh, six million went to Maduro. 
uh, Falcon and his campaign were just uh, written out of the story. I mean, Falcon was written out the way like a minor fiction, fictional character is sometimes taken out of a TV show. The writers just continue as if the character had never been in the story at all. So that's that's basically what the Western media did with Falcon. Um, another another justification uh, that the, that that was came out of the media's coverage at the time was basically to imply that the economic situation was so catastrophic that Maduro just couldn't, it was just not credible to believe that he had any any significant support or enough to win an election. And in fact, in the 2015 legislative elections, uh, the, the economy did cause Chavismo to lose their first major defeat at the national level since since Hugo Chavez's first election. And even in 2013, uh, when Maduro was first elected, he, he barely defeated Henrique Compriles, and the economic problems that were beginning to emerge were, were uh, part of the problem there. So... Um, there, I mean, there were other factors, but the economy was part of the problem that that led Capriles to do fairly well in 2013. So by 2018, uh, the, Ven the Venezuelan economy was in vastly worse shape. So how could Maduro have uh, any support left, never mind enough to win? So that that's kind of the general uh, argument that came out of a lot of Western media coverage at that time. But uh, what that what that analysis ignored is that is what the National Assembly did after winning uh, after it was taken over by the opposition. I mean, they went out of their way to make Venezuela's economic uh, problems worse. Two opposition politicians who led the National Assembly, Julio Borges and Henry Ramos, they both openly boasted about their efforts to scare foreigners away from doing business in Venezuela. And then in 2017, Trump dramatically escalated U.S. sanctions and even began to make military threats about, against Venezuela. So the Western media simply ignored how all of that would not only increase the number of people who voted for Maduro, but also intensified the, the support among his base, among his hardcore supporters. Now, another huge thing the media ignored um, was the, the governor's elections of 2017, which took place only like seven months before the uh, Maduro's election. And uh, again, the data analysis predicted that uh, the opposition would sweep uh, the, those elections and the exact opposite happened. And not only that, but a turnout at 61% was not even particularly low. That would be a high turnout for a U.S. presidential election. And Maduro's allies nationwide received 6 million votes, uh, which, uh, you know, lined up with what Maduro would receive months later when he won uh, the, the presidency. In fact, Francisco Rodriguez, who was um, a, a Maduro opponent, who was a key advisor to Henry Falcón, he, he conceded in his analysis of the governor's elections that, there, you know, there's no fraud that could possibly explain the results. He ultimately simply concluded that uh, the opposition support for Trump's aggression and for the economic sanctions just uh, gave a hu huge boost to uh, to Maduro and allowed him to triumph and to Maduro's allies in the governor's election. So, and, and also, and you look at um, the 6 million votes that Maduro received, roughly corresponds to about 30% of the electorate. And a Pew a research poll that came out shortly after the election in 2018 also showed that uh, Maduro, they, according to them, and this is a very establishment, Western establishment pollster. Not, I mean, you would never expect them to be uh, pro-Chavista. They, they said that Maduro's support was about 33% of the uh, of the electorate, uh, that the 33% of Venezuelans trust the national government to do what is right for Venezuela. So there was, there was no there was no excuse, really, at all for the Western media to keep repeating this line incessantly for years that the 2018 election was rigged and fraudulent. And it's just incredible to reflect on that now when you think of all the, the devastation that, that they inflicted on Venezuela based on that claim. And they'll do it again in 2024. Uh, there's no reason to think that they're not going to be. And so it's very important that we push back on every argument, on every uh, bogus assumption that they make. Um, it's also worth noting that in, in, in the United States, Canada and UK, especially where the, the kind of voting systems they have also allow like generally uh, most very typically the, uh, the, the winning candidate or party receives like 30 percent of the of the electorate. Uh, their votes, just like Maduro did in, in 2018, uh, and sometimes less than that. For example, in 20, 20, uh, in 2000, in 2012, Barack Obama received only 28 percent of the electorate, and in uh, 2016, uh, Trump received the votes of 26 percent of the electorate and didn't even win the popular vote. So there, there was actually no basis at all to ever consider that uh, uh, Maduro's electoral win in 2018 was was illegitimate. But uh, they'll recycle the same kind of lies and, and uh, absurd assumptions to uh, to impugn any victory if Maduro wins in 2024. So I'll just leave it there and just stress that um, Western propaganda doesn't rely on facts or logic. It just reply, it relies on repetition and intimidation. 
And it's up to us to push back against all of it and to not concede anything that we have no business conceding. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Leonardo. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Joe. We learned so much about different aspects of what's going on um, to Venezuela um, and our agency in fixing that and uh, you know, enabling the country to have sovereignty um, and, um, and do what it needs to do. Um, I did want to just uh, remind folks it has been posted in the chat, um, but we do have a forum to join the Venezuela Solidarity Network. We're so excited about the geographic uh, expanse um, of our network, and we want to celebrate that. But we'd also love to grow it. So please um, join the Venezuela Solidarity Network. Um, I'm going to go ahead and post the form. It has been posted, so thank you. Um, another aspect that uh, I personally really identify with, um, given my heritage um, of, of being a first-generation Venezuelan American, um, is the commune mo movement. Um, we unfortunately didn't hear so much about that this evening uh, because that's a very internal uh, affair on how Venezuela is reorganizing its economy. Um, but there are still ways outside that we can help that project. Um, and so I do want to go ahead and post um, a, a fundraiser uh, for the communes and the communard movement, which is helping to um, nationally organize all of the different communes in the country. Um, and so this form is a good way uh, to learn about the communes and the communard union. And if you are able uh, especially given the holidays, um, to reach into your pocketbook and send some resources their way um, so we can circumvent the sanctions. Um, we have really great activists working behind the scenes um, to reallocate resources um, and help them out. So please check out that uh, link at givebutter.com uh, that I posted. Um, but for now, we'd like to go ahead and segue into the question and answer session. Um, we see that we have some questions uh, posted in the Q&A box. Um, if you posted a question in the chat, um, unfortunately, it may have been lost. So please go ahead and find that and post it in the Q&A so we can be sure to incorporate that. Um, but for now, I would love if Allison could go ahead and pick our, our first question and have the panelists respond so we can dive even deeper um, to the comments that our champions um, explained. Awesome. Thank you, Marlon. Yes. So uh, there are some also new folks that have joined. So I'll say tonight we've covered a range of topics important to building solidarity with Venezuela's right to independence, sovereignty and self-determination from the Essequibo to the upcoming presidential election in Venezuela uh, to lies told about Venezuela's um, and, and, you know, democratic system to the impact of blank sanctions and blockade on Venezuela. Uh, and we welcome all questions to do with that. If you've missed the first part of the presentation, we will put out a video recording soon, uh, but also welcome any questions in the Q&A chat. And thank you all for joining. Um, I wanted to start with uh, a question uh, that I think is fitting for uh, the formation of the Venezuela Solidarity Network and uh, our, our work to broaden and deepen Venezuela solidarity. Uh, I'm wondering if um, panelists might comment on uh, it, how we can work to bring people into the Venezuela Solidarity Movement that uh, have been uh, not, you know, have been critical, as the, the question says, of Maduro. Um, they claim that they are against Western imperialism or intervention in Venezuela, but that they don't support the current government um, where they would were, um, you know, supporters of Chavez in the past. So there's uh, some folks like that in our circles. And how would you respond to someone and, and encourage them to get involved in solidarity at this time? Um, who wants to start out? Well, I'll take that one first. Thanks. You know, I think uh, I, I'm not going to speak about the actual individuals that were mentioned in this question because because I think it, it's better to talk about more in general because we, there are folks that we all know that were very kind of fond of Chavez and then have been soured on Maduro. And I think part of it really is there has been such a media blitz against Maduro over the past 10 years. Uh, 
let me just give you a bit of like a, something personal. So I started working at the Venezuelan embassy in Washington, D.C. in 2008 as a media analyst. And really, that just opened my eyes because it was every day the attacks on Chavez, despite the fact that Chavez was widely respected and very popular internationally. And then when Chavez passes away and Maduro uh, won the election, you know, I being someone who considered himself media savvy at that point, I was just shocked at how much the attacks against Maduro intensified. And if you have people that are talking to you about how awful Maduro is, really, I think the important thing is to really almost change the conversation because this isn't about Maduro. This is about the fact that the United States has been waging hybrid war in Venezuela for the past 10 years, has been waging economic war on Venezuela, has imposed sanctions that have killed at least 100,000 people that have driven millions of people around the country. And if you have folks that are focused on Maduro, We'll tell them, you know, it, it's not Maduro that you need to support. It's the Venezuelan people. And right now, the biggest threat to the Venezuelan people, the biggest violation of human rights against the Venezuelan people is coming from the United States and from the United States allies. And it's coming in the form of sanctions and attempted coups and subterfuge and, you know, all the things that we've been talking about for, for not just this panel, but in many panels prior. So for those folks that, you know, are don't like Maduro, Tell them to forget about Maduro. Tell them to really worry about the Venezuelan people and that the only way to help the Venezuelan people is to ensure that the United States stops interfering in this. Anyone else like to comment? Yeah, I would tell those people that I do like Maduro and... Uh... I would just push back on this. I, I, I know where Leo is coming from, and that, that could be a good straight very I mean, with some people, maybe that's the best approach. But I, I think it's important to, to push back on assumptions um, and just and just point out that our responsibility, and it kind of, to kind of echo what Leo says, is that our responsibility is to hold our own our own governments accountable. So if our governments are, are, uh, are hurting people, then regardless, I mean, we should be outraged that, for instance, Biden uh, stole half of Afghanistan's bank of uh, central bank reserves. And none of us likes the Taliban. I don't. I don't know of anybody on the left who who supports the Taliban or thinks they're good. But we should be outraged by that. So because it's about us holding our own governments accountable. That's that's the that's what we should focus on. I, I agree with both of you, uh, Leonardo. You're quite right, and so is so is Joe. I don't have much patience with people who say to me, no me gusta uh, Maduro. I don't like Maduro. I, I, it, because it's irrelevant whether you like him or not. What is important is what is important for Venezuela. Uh, and that is, I think, what Leonardo is saying. And that's what we must push back on, as Joe is saying. Uh, we have to think, um, we have to make these people understand that Maduro has faced what Chavez never had to face. Maduro has had a way larger burden than than what Chavez did. Although, uh, you know, there was a coup against uh, Chavez too. But there have been so many coups against uh, uh, Maduro. Uh, and, and Chavez was was governing when we had a lot of money, but Maduro has to face something that no other president in Venezuelan history had to face. And I always defend Maduro because of that. And when people say, I don't like him, I would say, you know, tough luck. Your <laughs> likes or dislikes uh, is, is unimportant to me because what is more important is what is the best for Venezuela and who has kept this fish this this ship afloat it has been maduro and and i must say his excellent team one of the things i value most about uh, maduro is that he has brought in really wonderful people around him and he is generous with them generous in um in in, uh, in allowing them to act and and in recognizing uh, what what they do so yes i defend maduro and I try to defend him when people say that they don't like him. I said, tell me why. <laughs> and then I go from there. But the most important thing, what's important for Venezuela? That's incredible, everybody. Yeah, I, no matter which way you want to come at this, 
uh, we know that we're on the right side of history and that we're doing good work. Um, our next question um, is regarding the uh, Essequibo territorial dispute. Um, please everyone share in, but of course we'd love to start uh, hearing from Maria. Um, the first question is regarding the International Court of Justice, if we can expand about their role, uh, why they do or do not have um, jurisdiction. Um, in addition to their uh, recent ruling that Venezuela has the right to conduct a referendum on the Essequibo, has it made any other rulings about the border dispute? Um, and then a second aspect of that from another uh, attendee is something that I, I just I, I need someone to explain this to me. Uh, when I was reading about uh, Guayana's accusations um, of Venezuela uh, intervening and invading even, um, apparently it goes beyond this. Uh, uh, an attendee asks, can any of the panelists, um, perhaps uh, Dr. Baez Victor, respond to the allegations that Venezuela wants to take over Aruba and the Dutch Antilles? I, the, the attendee, has have relatives from Aruba who claim this. Um, and is this just Dutch and larger Western corporate or state media lies? Or what is this referring to? Oh, you you really made me laugh with that last one. That's a that's a really wonderful one. Oh yes, it's gonna take over Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao, we're gonna take over all of the, the Caribbean. No, Venezuela, in fact, has good relationships with uh, with the Dutch, uh, uh, the Dutch islands. And I have to tell you, those Dutch islands depend so much on Venezuela because their their uh, agriculture is is nil practically. All they are is like gigantic casinos with the with the tourists, and they they need a lot of stuff from Venezuela. So, uh, in fact, uh, when uh, when they're right now, all all their planes are arriving to Venezuela and they were more happy I think than Venezuela for that so no the first thing I want to say is there are no plans whatsoever in Venezuela by anybody to take over uh, the, uh, the the Netherlands islands in the Caribbean that was really quite funny uh, <laughs> but um about the international you know you know these international courts they pick these judges they say, okay, we're going to pick these judges, we're going to put this there, and then we're going to make a decision. They, they are, um, how can I say, arbitrary most of the time. And 90% of the, de of the decisions of these international courts that come up are always against the little country, okay? So they, there is a vicious thing underlying these international courts. I don't have all my data here right now, but that this is what has happened. So why is it... it, it are we against this? First of all, there are 193 countries in the world that do not recognize the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. I wonder why. Maybe they, they, they've they looked at the statistics too. 192, including, by the way, the United States. When, when this court told the United States that they have to give reparations to Nicaragua because of the horror of the Contras, you know, and, and, and filed against the United States. Guess what the United States said? Oh, we, we're just not going to listen to them. And they didn't listen to them and said, we don't recognize you. So now all of a sudden, Venezuela has to listen to this. Guess what? The last judge that they put in there, the last judge they put in there was a, a supporter of Juan Guaido. That's how they choose and pick these judges. Then the second idea is, the second reason is a substantial one. And that is, According to their own, uh, let's say, mandate, both countries who bring a demand have to come to that court and agree. So a country can't uh, by themselves go up to this court. So Guyana and Venezuela both have to agree to that jurisdiction for them to make a, a, a decision. What happened here? Guyana went by itself. So when Delcy Rodriguez went before that court, it went to defend itself against what Ujana was saying. And the first words out of her mouth was, my presence here does not mean that Venezuela accepts your jurisdiction because we don't. So um, that is one of the reasons why the international um, 
uh, court of justice, uh, Venezuela doesn't want it because there's already a mechanism. In 1966, the UN Geneva Accord uh, agreed that that there had been fraud in 18, uh, 1899 and that from now on it was Venezuela and Guyana together using the what's called the, uh, the the good offices of the UN where they choose someone who would help them uh, negotiate they would agree amicably whatever dispute and that was working until they discovered oil by by, by Exxon Mobil so um Venezuela says the, the only mechanism that we're going to have is that one. Just yesterday, the president of Guyana had <laughs> the temerity to say, oh, we want Cuba to come and mediate between Venezuela and Guyana. And you know what Venezuela said? Well, no, we won't have it because we don't need anyone to mediate, not even, not even our great friend uh, Cuba, because the only mechanism that is that is legal and judicial is the Geneva Accord. Um, so no, we won't have these hand-picked judges that uh, always uh, usually file against the little guys. Thank you. Would anyone else like to echo those comments or add something that may have been missed? If not, we will move on to the next question. Just briefly, because Maria really was excellent on that, on, on the whole Essequibo issue. Uh, I don't know if Maria mentioned it, but actually today there were direct talks between Venezuela's foreign minister and Guyana's foreign minister. And it's oh. the first time in years that they've talked. And that's oh. basically a direct result of the referendum. Yep. <laughs> excellent. That's what Venezuela has wanted. You and me sit down here and we'll fix it. We don't need anybody in the middle. Thank you. Yes, good point. So uh, we do have another question, a uh, topic we briefly talked about today, uh, which is also part of the Venezuela Solidarity Network's work, and that is regarding Alex Saab, Venezuelan diplomat held in a U.S. jail. Uh, so um, the question is asking, how are things developing for winning the release of Alex Saab? And so just an update would be great about his case. And I was wondering if Leonardo could start us off with this one. Sure. So last I heard, the case is still ongoing. It, it's still just facing lots of delays. I think one of the things that the United States is really trying to do is push this case, you know, extend it as long as it can, uh, because it really wants to try to break Alex Saab and extract information from Alex Saab to harm Venezuela's ability to overcome the sanctions. But one of the positive developments is that there's been increasing pressure in the United States from families of US citizens detained in Venezuela. And a few weeks ago, the State Department identified three US citizens as being quote unquote wrongfully detained, according to them. And we're talking about uh, men from California, Texas, and Florida. And yet the Biden administration, despite the Barbados dialogue, did nothing to secure their release when they could have been easily swapped for Alex Saab. Uh, and so I think one of the things that we're gonna do going forward, as I mentioned in my talk, is try to really link the cases of these quote unquote wrongfully detained people to Alex Saab to, in order to really highlight what's happening to Alex Saab in Congress and Capitol Hill, because I can guarantee you, I, don't, I would be shocked if any member of Congress knew who Alex Saab was. And so that's one of the things we're going to be pushing on. Great, thank you. Yeah, and uh, his trial, Alex Saab's trial, has been pushed all the way to June 2024. So the U.S. government keeps um, moving the trial as a further form of punishment and torture against Alex Saab, who, uh, just in case anyone on here is not familiar, uh, was uh, arrested in Cape Verde, held on house arrest, and then kidnapped and put in jail in the U.S. under allegations of money laundering. Uh, but in reality, it is allegations against Alex Saab uh, for his work to circumvent U.S. sanctions against Venezuela. Um, so we do have one more uh, question tonight, and uh, that has to do uh, with a uh, kind of how we can approach uh, this uh, claim by some folks who will say that uh, sanctions and blockade by the US, Canada, the European Union on Venezuela 
how can they have such a big impact? It's, you know, can't Venezuela just trade with other countries easily? And isn't Venezuela already trading with China, Russia, et cetera? Um, so I'm just wondering some of the thoughts from panelists about how you respond to that question about um, how, you know, how is it that sanctions can be, as reported, um, responsible for 40,000 deaths between 2017 and 2018? Uh, isn't it uh, just a matter of Venezuela being able to trade with other countries? Uh, uh, Joe, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I great. Just, I just want, <laughs> just want to mention one basic thing that uh, uh, Andresa Rose pointed this out. He's, he's the, um, he was a presidential candidate for Ecuador in in. 2021 and the vice presidential candidate in 20, uh, well, just happened, just 2022, um, 2023, sorry. And, you know, for two countries in Latin America to trade with each other, uh, just, you know, Argentina wants to trade with uh, Brazil or something. The money has to transit through U.S. banks uh, because the U.S. financial system is so dominant still um, that even routine trade between two countries has nothing to do with the United States ends up uh, giving the United States an excuse to, to, to claim jurisdiction to, for, to investigate money laundering or alleged corruption. So it's just that the U.S. financial system is still extremely powerful. Uh, I, I heard a stat that something like 60% of the central bank reserves globally go th transit through the U.S. are held in the U.S. Uh, financial system. So they have this tremendous leverage that they, I mean, they emerged from the World War II as the, by far the, but arguably the most powerful country to ever exist. So uh, they just have this tremendous power that even though it's in decline, it's still it's still a, a tremendous it has this uh, capacity to inflict so much damage on countries all over the world. So uh, that's 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 the root of it. And it, it takes a long time for uh, for a lot of reasons for independent uh, mechanisms to, to, to emerge that will bypass that. And it requires boldness on the part of governments that even when the progressive leaning hasn't always been there. So that that would be my take on that. Maria, you're on mute. I I have I have an anecdote to tell you. Uh, why actually it's not forty thousand; it's a hundred thousand Venezuelans that have died. Um, I had a dear dear first cousin. She was older than me. I loved her very dearly, and she died of cancer because they could not get the medicines that she needed for it. And, and she wasn't a poor person. She, she, if, if it was there to be bought, she would have bought it. But there was no way that this medicine could come to Venezuela, not through her doctors, not through the public hospital that she was in or even a private one. So a lot of those deaths have to do with not being able to buy medicines. Because, you know, with medicines, uh, they are, are patent. You know, there's a, uh, people own it or companies own it. It isn't as if Venezuela could say, okay, we're going to open a little lab and we're going to make the, the latest uh, medicine for, let's say, bone cancer or whatever. You know, this is beyond the, that capacity. And so the fact that Venezuela could not buy not only me patent me medicines, but also many of the things that hospitals needed, uh, ordinary sort of uh, uh, elements that the hospital needed, is because they couldn't buy it anywhere. Not even the government could buy it. And this was uh, people who had need of insulin. One of the great things that Russia did was bring in great uh, 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 planes full of the medicine of insulin that so many people wanted. Uh, people who had so many uh, uh, chronic diseases that needed constant medicine, they were not available. And let me tell you, during a pandemic, Canada and the United States blocked Pfizer and Moderna from selling the vaccine to Venezuela. This this is unconscionable to me. I will never I will never remember that. Fortunately, fortunately, Russia, China, and Cuba were there to bring uh, medicines to Venezuela. But I don't think Venezuela will ever remember that during a pandemic um, we were not allowed to to have. Uh, 
to have the, these vaccines. So these people who have died are because of the lack of medicines and uh, other things that the, that the doctors needed, apart from the food. But the food was very good because of what Marlon was talking about, the communes. The communes fed Venezuela. And I, one of the things I think we as Venezuelans must be very proud of was uh, the fact that Venezuela has managed to feed its people. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, Venezuela, especially over the past 25 years since the Bolivarian Revolution began, has spent roughly 80% of its budget on social investment. And because of the sanctions, Venezuela's income, its income uh, pre predominantly from oil, fell 99%. So if you have 80% of your budget going to social investment, including health, a big chunk, and suddenly that budget falls by 99%, it's going to cause havoc throughout every social safety net you can think of. And that's directly going to cause not just deaths, but migration. So when they talk to you about, well, why are all these Venezuelans leaving? It's not because of economic mismanagement. It's because of sanctions destroying the social safety net, because of sanctions destroying the health sector. And that's why people are dying and leaving. And then on the other point of the question of, well, why can't just Venezuela trade with China and Russia if that's what uh, I understood correctly from the question. You know, Joe was talking about it. And I, I think another element is that for years, the only way to transfer money between banks was through this system called SWIFT, uh, this system, uh, an interbanking system, and that's been controlled by the United States and it's in dollars. And Venezuela was blocked from carrying out transactions through SWIFT for many years. Yeah. And it's only in the last couple of years that we're seeing alternatives arise pr predominantly through Russia and China and BRICS. And actually Venezuela signed this huge deal cooperation agreement with uh, China last September, uh, 31 uh, bilateral agreements. And they're gonna see investment in uh, several cities uh, and in throughout several sectors. And I think that's gonna have a big impact on Venezuela's economy in the medium and long term. And that is also another factor and why the United States suddenly agreed to this Barbados agreement, because they see that the sanctions are slowly being overcome because the world is changing. Because BRICS, uh, particularly China, is having more and more power, more and more influence. And if they try continually try to push Venezuela uh, to, to, to you know engage in regime change in Venezuela, what's going to happen and what has been happening is that Venezuela is going to have to find other partners. And it has, as we've been mentioned, Russia and China, among others. Uh, but the another issue with the sanctions is as well, uh, which I forgot to mention, is that there's this thing called secondary sanctions. So some companies that do business in Venezuela that are not from the United States can face fines or sanctions themselves for doing business with Venezuela. And we saw this happening with Russian businesses in particular. Uh, and that's a big deal because every business also has to do business with the United States. Not every, but most, right? So if you're blocked out of the U.S. market, because you're doing business with Venezuela, the easiest thing to do is to just not do business with Venezuela. So th that's called secondary sanction, right? And we actually we saw um, an airline, oh, I'm totally blanking on that, I think it was Gopa Airlines that paid a big fine a few years ago, because as I mentioned before, commercial airlines are not allowed to fly to Venezuela from the United States. But what Gopa was doing was, was saying, well, We'll stop by in Panama first, and then you can go directly to Venezuela, and we'll just sell you the same ticket it, to make it easier for people going to Venezuela to not have to, like, say, take out their luggage at the airport and then recheck in, which is kind of a nightmare if you've ever tried to do that. And the U.S. didn't like that, and they slapped a big fine on Copa Airlines. And so, you know, there it, when, we're, when we're talking about sanctions, it's not just like, oh, they signed some document saying you can't trade anymore in this sector. They actively pursue people and corporations that try to engage with business in Venezuela. It's not just some passive thing. It's very active and very targeted. And, and you know, that's something that we're, we have to continually raise awareness about. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, we have exhausted our questions. Of course, we could go on and on, but we're going to stop it there. I've loved spending the evening with you all. We do have a little bit left. We want to have some closing remarks um, from our panelists. Um, 
And we're going to cap those at three minutes each. So we'll be watching time and direct messaging you um, just, just to make sure that we all can can get a good night's rest this evening. Um, I would like to play with the order a little bit uh, just to make sure that everyone is able um, to be prioritized in, in an equitable manner. Um, so I'd like to start off with Joe um, and then put Leonardo in the middle and then finish off with Maria, if that's all right with everybody. Um, so uh, we'd love to hear um, some closing remarks. And specifically, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like you to include um, why it is so important to build solidarity um, within the uh, with the Venezuela Solidarity Network um, as the avenue for that. Um, so, Joe, please. Uh, okay. Uh, well, we're we're living. You know, we're all of us are living in the belly of the beast, as they as they say. We're we're closest to where uh, decisions are made that uh, do tremendous harm to Venezuelans, to to people all over the world. So it's uh, you know we can have a we can have a positive impact. Uh, we can we can have you know, different ideas about how to go about it, but it, it, we have to work together uh, and, and reach as many people as we can. I'm a strong believer that we have to find a way to build uh, political parties or, or, or media that are independent and uh, so that we're not just basically begging the Western media to do better. I mean, we, we're analyzing them. We're seeing what they're what they're saying that's wrong, that's dishonest and, and so forth, but we're, we're trying to build something independent that... that um, that people can find and, and so the only way to do that is to, is to it, it takes time but to build it through networking and uh finding like-minded people and spreading the word uh as long as we're able to do that uh and to do it as much as we can so uh, that's 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 really the about all i all i can all i can say at this point yeah i mean i think one of the things that we have right now is that there is already a lot of solidarity work going on throughout Canada and the United States with Venezuela. Uh, and it has been for many years, but we haven't really had a hub where we can all talk about what we're doing, where we can all coordinate our actions. And that's one of the kind of reasons, I think, to have a strong Venezuela solidarity network, is to keep each other informed so that we can all be on the same page in terms of doing actions together. Uh, and not have it be kind of an ad hoc thing where like, oh, I'm going to text Allison to see what fire this time is up to regarding Alex Saab to see if we can do something together. No, it's, you know, let's all talk together all at the same time and strategize together and come, you know, to agreements on what we can do. And the other point I want to make is that we're trying to make this kind of a broad tent, right? I mean, I think we happen to be, I, I, mean, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but I'm Chavista, you know, uh, I'm a Venezuelan revolutionary. But I don't think this is a space that is, you know, is going to require anyone to be a revolutionary in any way. I think we have a lot of room for folks who want to engage in solidarity from other kind of political perspectives when we have goals in common. And we're seeing more and more that sanctions and particularly this concept of collective punishment against civilians, which has been an ongoing theme throughout this uh, two months of war on Palestine. Uh, we're we're seeing that come into the consciousness more and more, and as in and tying that concept into what's been going on against Venezuela, against Cuba, against Nicaragua, against Syria, Afghanistan, against any of the dozens I, I forget how many countries are sanctions now, but it, but it's over fifty, I believe. Uh, and so we have a lot of groups doing all this great work, but this is a way to bring them all together. And I'm really happy that we're launching this. And I know, you know, I think we have we're gonna have a lot of room to grow. And I'm excited to see what what this is what we're going to be able to do in the future as part of the Venezuela Solidarity Network. Oh, sh um, should I speak now? Yes, no worries. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I'm I'm very hopeful for this group. Um, I think that uh, we need, as Leonardo says, to come together uh, to be able to exchange our ideas um, with each other, but also because solidarity is something that the world needs so much today. We we live in these uh, northern countries where there, um, you don't generally see too much of the solidarity that you wish to see, and we, we, we must make it. When I go to Venezuela, even the Venezuela with sanctions, even with the Venezuela where things uh, are not there, I always come back so filled with optimism because Venezuela has faced 
uh, quite a monster and yet has prevailed. Who would have thought that Venezuela would not have sort of succumbed to all the, the, the attacks that it has had? It's because they had solidarity, because they came together and because they, they faced this uh, enemy uh, uh, holding hands. And I think that we who live up here, as Joe says, in the belly of the beast, also have to hold hands and look for the ways in which can reduce fear and we can reduce hatred and we can uh, go forward with optimism towards, towards a better future because uh, the future is, is all of us, you know. Uh, it, 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 if if one uh, country is is suffering, and so so will we all. It's like uh, John Don said, uh, you know, for whom the bells toll, it, it it tolls for us. So I want to thank you all so much for your solidarity for Venezuela, and of course we should be solidarity to all the suffering people in the world. Thank you so much for organizing this. That's excellent. Thank you again to Maria Paez, Victor, Joe Emersberger, Leonora Flores, Marla Nunez, my co-host. Uh, we just have a few announcements to close us off tonight. And I will say this recording, as I said, will become available. I encourage people to share it. Um, there's important information and also where we've just ended and with the beautiful words of Maria, call to action. Now is the time to get involved. Um, I wanted to uh, announce uh, that the uh, next uh, monthly picket action for free Alex Saab, US Canada hands off Venezuela is on Tuesday, December 19th at 4 p.m. Uh, Vancouver or Pacific time and 7 p.m. Eastern Toronto time. Uh, you can register online at tinyurl.com slash hands off VZLA. I'll put the link in the chat. Uh, and that is organized by the Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg and Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, as well as Just Peace Advocates. Um, and these actions have been going on monthly. This is the 34th monthly picket action. And I, many people on this call and, and on the panel have joined them to speak and really appreciate all of that. Leonardo has also put in the chat, a code pink campaign to free to uh, unfreeze. unfreeze. Yeah, there we go. The three point two billion dollars in frozen Venezuelan funds to be administered by the UN for humanitarian purposes, uh, and that is uh, there is a, a petition uh, to join that campaign, and the link is in the chat. And I encourage folks to join that. Um, and then also just to say that we need to join, uh, we need all of you to join the Venezuela Solidarity Network and not just people listening now, but I encourage you to copy this link. We'll start sharing it around. We're ready to invite more people in to join us and hopefully broaden and deepen our united uh, work across the US and Canada. And so there is a forum to join. And we will be having our next meeting on December 11th at 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern time. So you'll see that announcement as well. Uh, very much appreciate everyone's uh, time and energy and thoughts tonight, all your questions. And uh, again, to the panelists and, and my co-host, Marlon, thank you from myself. From And uh, Marlon, floor is yours. Thank you, everybody. I just wanted to like one last minute plug um, to learn more about the communes uh, and support their work. I posted um, the link to the fundraiser once more um, in the chat. But other than that, um, I would like to wish everyone a buenas noches. Um, some, it's pretty late for some of you. So thanks so much for um, being flexible with all the different time zones. I'm in mountain time um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Okay. Hasta la victoria siempre. Venceremos. Venceremos.